Are tvOS providers running out of options to differentiate the experience? And do all tvOS providers look the same to smart TV manufacturers? Not according to Xperi TiVo. Listen on to find out why. This is End Screen Noise. My name is Colin Dixon, founder and chief analyst at End Screen Media. And today is March 22nd, 2023. Late last year, Xperi launched the TiVo OS, a solution for smart TV manufacturers to power their devices. At the time, Will Richmond of Video News and I talked with Gia Scarden, who is EVP and Chief Products and Services Officer at Xperi, Xperi Corporation, about the launch on our Inside the Stream podcast. We discussed Xperi's purchase of Viewed and how it helps bolster the company's entry into the TV OS market. Since then, Xperi and Vestel have shipped the first TiVo OS powered TVs. And if you want to learn a lot more about TiVo and Xperi, then I really suggest you give that podcast a quick listen. Just come to the End Screen Media website, search on Xperi and look for the first Inside the Stream listing. At the Connected TV World Summit today in London, I took the opportunity to catch up with Xperi's Gabriel Cosgrave, who is GM of EMEA, and Patrick Burden, who is VP of Business Development and Strategy, about the TiVo OS. At the conference, several TV OS vendors suggested that there wasn't much difference in their interfaces and little room to innovate. This struck me as odd, and I wanted to ask Mr. Cosgrave and Mr. Burden about that and how they're differentiating TiVo OS from other TV OS's OS providers. So here's the interview. Hope you enjoy it. This is Colin Dixon with End Screen Media, and I'm at the Connected TV World Forum in London, and I'm speak, speaking with Patrick Burden, who's VP of Business Development and Strategy for, uh, for Xperi. And I'm also talking with Gabriel Cosgrave, who's GM EMEA at Xperi. That's right. And, uh, we had a very interesting conversation about TVOSs, and of course, you've just entered that market, as as our audience knows. Um, and there were two things that came up in that that I thought were really interesting, and I'm I'm kind of wanted to challenge some of the things that we heard. The first thing we heard was that the interfaces that. It's very getting very difficult to differentiate TVOS is based on the interfaces because you know, they're beginning to look a little similar. Um, so let's talk about that. I, isn't there still room to innovate here? Yeah, I, I think so. I think I think if you look at them from a helicopter view, maybe they all look very similar, and I, I take that point. But I think there's definitely room for innovation, and I think. There's a few different ways you can do that around search and recommendation and, and true personalization. I mean, there's you know you can capture data so you can understand the viewer, but also using you know AI tools to capture deeper level metadata so you can create interesting links between different types of content. Right. So we 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 talk about the example of maybe the movie like Elf, matching that with King Kong because there's great Empire State Building scenes in both and maybe you're nostalgic about New York in winter you know there's all this kind of different levels of uh, recommendations that you can get to and I think that's really interesting and I think that can actually drive engagement and we've seen this as well with our, with our own services but also with our, our partner services where you can compare what we call personalized content discovery versus other solutions and see a much higher engagement level with our service, with our you know, with our metadata and with our search and recommendations. Right. I think when we were talking, Gabriel made a good point, is that you know, we we, we look at a very kind of a three sixty view of it's not just about search and recommendation as a component. It's not just about voice as a component, it's not just about metadata as a component. It's the full yeah. you know experience. Everything and working I, together. And I think if you, exactly if you blend all those together then you, you get some interesting use cases. And I think voice is, is a key part. Voice has always been a key part of what TiVo has done on, on all our interfaces. But on the TiVo OS, I think it's especially powerful because we have control of the full end-to-end solution. We have control of all of the audio and all of the voice. So it can allow us to do things like, you know, start to play with things like biometrics. So you can start looking at, you know, what really drives personalization. And and can you get away from things like sign-ins? Can you get away from profiles by using voice biometrics? And maybe even ultimately using you know, some of the camera technology that we have within Xperia to drive personalization. So I think, you know, the the short answer is I think we can definitely do more. 
I think we can do more to differentiate ourselves. And all, although it may look on a certain level like they're all very similar user experiences, I think under the hood there's a lot more that we can do. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you mentioned um, biometrics and you mentioned particularly cameras. Uh, in give, a, give us a flavor for the sort of things you're doing in cars. That, that sure. will give us an idea of what could be done in the TV yeah. space. I mean, you know, cameras have been in the car for a number of years now for safety reasons alone. Xperi um, has uh, in-cabin monitoring solutions, occupant monitoring solutions, and driver monitoring solutions. So we, we already are in that space of computer vision and image processing for the automotive industry. Uh, for a number of, 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 of European brands in particular. Um, but if you think about, uh, I talked today about how video is going to end up in the car and how that already, the car has so much technology ahead of a television, actually, yeah. from a superpower perspective of cameras, but also the, 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 the ability of processing of audio all around you, everything like that, it's already there. So if you can bring entertainment and increase that with video delivery into the car, you can already start to look at profiles and other things because it knows who's in the car and it knows when and what you're watching, right? So from an advertisement pers advertiser's perspective, that's further than they'll ever be a lot in the TV space, right? Because they actually know eyes are watching something, and they know from a profile, if obviously user consents and other things in the automotive industry, if you, you're signing up to use the car, you're signing up to use what's in there. So you already have some consent to use the cameras and therefore build out profiles. And the music industry can do that as well from a playlists and other things of like that. So there's a lot that's going to happen yeah. um, in the world of content and entertainment consumption in the car, given that it already has things like cameras <coughs> and, and uh, microphones and voice instruments in cars. And, and this really does sound like real differentiation, right? Because one of the biggest problems with the TVOS and it is, is signing in is such a, yeah. it's so fraught with, with problems, right? Yeah. Um, this, it w you wouldn't need to sign in. No. No, I mean, you, you, you know, if you use camera or if you start, if you use voice and that creates a sign-in process and it's, you know, you, you know that it's me watching, but then you can also, you know, there's other signals that you can use in terms of what device you're watching on, yep. what time of day, you know, what time of the week and all that kind of stuff. So you blend all of these signals together and you can get real personalization or real, or real drive. But I think, I think, you know, voice is a, is a really good one. I mean, ultimately... What you're trying to do is drive engagement and reduce churn, right? That's what that's yep. what, you know a lot, a lot of people want to do. People who use voice use it repeatedly. You know, once you start using voice to find, I passion. was very surprised. I asked the audience how many had used voice control or voice search yeah, I mean, in, and it was a packed house um, in in the last week. Yeah. Virtually everybody raised their hand. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, well. If you add to that, actually, once they start using it, they use it very regularly. Yeah. So, so the average use in a house is probably about. 35 to 36 queries per month so more than one a day somebody will look for content yeah and if you measure that against text search which is you know the traditional way of doing that that's usually one to two per month so you're kind of you're breaking down barriers and finding the content much quicker and the customers are happier as a result so i think that's that's a differentiator right that's that's yeah. really important yeah yeah i think some other differentiation for the ux perspective as you asked that question to the panel earlier if you come at it from two perspectives, one is the consumer and one is the TV manufacturer, right? So the consumer, obviously, you don't have a sea of apps approach, you have a content-centric approach, but, but also when you select something, your time to content is shorter because it's in front of you and recommendation engines will do a better job for, for finding what you're, you really like. Um, but when you press play, it plays. It doesn't open yeah. an application and then start playing something. It just plays no matter where your, your subscriptions. Um, and the TVOS solution actually allows you uh, show everything that's on the platform, whether you're subscribed to it or not for surfacing content, or narrow it down to what you're subscribed to only. Right. Um, as well as its uh, universal search goes across linear, OTT, etc. So it's a very powerful one-stop shop for consumers. The second thing from the, o the TVOEM's perspective is brand, right? It's... Uh, TiVo's model and approach with the OEMs, and we'll talk about the business model in a second, but has been that it's not a TiVo TV. It's a, it's a powered by TV, but it's a Vestel TV, for mm -hmm. example. And what we're seeing with other, other uh, OS providers is the brand is front and center uh, from the big tech or the other companies that are providing OS. Is that's the, you, you almost see that bigger than the small label on the front of the TV that actually is the TV manufacturer. So the dilution of brand for TV OEMs has become a real problem. Yeah. Um, from an OS provider perspective, we're, we're going to change that. Um, 
so that the TV brand is, is much more prominent. So let's talk, let's talk about this business differentiation for the TV OEMs. Uh, this is an area where you really are going very hard to differentiate yourself. Tell us what you're yeah. doing now. Yeah, I think it becomes about reoccurring revenue streams for the TV manufacturers, mm -hmm. right? Because the you know there's the model for many years with, with we just call them big tech has been some some incentives up front, uh, some go to retail market uh, pushes, but really then it becomes about uh, the technology roadmaps of uh, is also a problem for TV OEMs where they're just forced to update things on someone else's schedule. We're actually TiVo's taking a very different approach as we will sh uh, do an advertising rev share or an inventory share depending on what we're doing, but think about ad revenue share. We will share that back with the TV manufacturers directly. Um, so they have a, an ongoing reoccurring revenue stream post point of sale for the life of that TV, mm -hmm. right? Which is huge for them, right? Because they, now they can reinvest that back into innovations or yeah. other TVs or brand efforts or marketing efforts and lots of other things they couldn't do today. Um, so I think that that's that's why we're getting a lot of uh, attraction into the market, and we want to disrupt that model um, and and drive that 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 slight that different business model as well as a collaborative effort on on technology release and roadmaps. You know, yeah. there will be some certain OS updates that you need to do, but we'll decide with the TV audience when we do that, yeah. and not not force them into into the, the so-called wall gardens approach, right? Yeah. Pat, it, it doesn't only give them money, right? It gives them something that they've never really had before, and that's data on the people using the set. Yeah, yeah, and I think, um, you know, we've captured data on our set-top boxes for a long time, and we've a data business in, in the States that has been monetizing that as well. So there's, there's two things you can do with data. Obviously, it allows you to understand your viewers. You can know what their behavior is, what apps they're watching, how much they're using voice, what are they looking for? what works from a performance level so we can actually test you know what, what what are fail searches and what are successful searches and then you can change the user experience based on what works so there's all that performance level analytics that's really important and we can give that to our partners but there's also this opportunity to you know have viewership data of what content people watch yeah. but also you know Gabriel mentioned advertising so you actually if you know what content people watch and if that's ad supported content then you know what ads they watched as well. Yeah. So that then gives you know some of our platform partners a, a different you know way to sell to advertisers because they know you know how much people are engaged, how much they're watching content, what's the content that works best for a certain type of advertiser. So all of that data exists within our world today, and we have you know a very mature ad business that's been monetizing that. So you know one of the things that we're looking at is how do we share that? How do we how do we work with our OEM partners and maybe even the retailers to, to expose some of that content. Yeah. And you know that that uh, the data and the revenue streams can be really valuable. I've noticed that uh, Roku now is earning $40 a year from each one of its active users. Vizio in the States is earning $24 a year from each one of its active users. All the profit is coming from that business. So this sounds like a really critical piece of the puzzle that will actually enable smaller TV TV set manufacturers to continue to be profitable and viable businesses. Yeah, no, for sure. And and, and as as Avod and Fast is only growing all the time, and you saw that in the the, the TV video trends report, the US is now at eleven different subscriptions. And yes, different things. it is. I mean, Europe maybe is not quite there yet, but uh, certainly it's it's probably in the six or seven range. So. The point being that more advertising is coming in different elements. The key to that is personalized advertising so that you don't you can become a little bit more tolerant of that and uh, knowing that you're not paying a subscription in Avon, for example, or fast. But so, you know, but to your point, the revenue stream opportunities for T V manufacturers, big or small, is 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 now I would call it firmly disrupted uh, and, and <laughs> yeah. now open, right? That the, the door is open for business. Right? Yeah, yeah. And there are still a heck of a lot of TV manufacturers that don't have a solution. Everybody thinks, oh, everybody's got the smart TV out there now. But, you know, when I look at the data, at least 40 to 50 percent of smaller TV, well, 40 to 50 percent of the television market is actually smaller, more regional television providers. Um, that, that sounds like a golden opportunity for you. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, monetization relies on ARPU, as you yep. as you referenced, and you know, there's there's certain parts of the world that are are high in ARPU and others that are not so high. Not in quite ARPU, so much. So, yeah. so uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's opportunity um, everywhere because the world is evolving all the time. 
Um, so I think I think uh, there's there's you know as I said, whether you're small or big, the door the door is starting to open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, this has been fantastic. You've really helped clear up that there is still an opportunity for uh, for differentiation, both in the interface and in the business model. Uh, so, and you're already off and running with Vestel in in Europe, and I guess more to come. More to come. More to come. More to come. Pat, Gabriel, thank you very much, Welcome both of you. This has been Colin Dixon with Endscreen Media.